It turns out that people have in them not just an instinct for generosity, but an instinct to respond to other people's kindness. This is just such a beautiful thing because in this connected age, if you can start a ripple of generosity, of kindness, there will be ripple effects. I know you all have heard of a TED Talk. I bet you've watched a few new TED Talks. Well, the head of the organization behind TED Talks is Chris Anderson. He thinks a little generosity can change the world. And if you're a little skeptical, here's what Chris has to say about that. In this connected age, the rules around what you give away have changed. And so every business should think hard about what is your generosity strategy. It could be the most important decision you make. We tried to get it on TV. TV thought that public lectures are so boring, my friend, don't be silly, go away. And so it wasn't until we actually tried it online and they went viral that we realized that was the thing we could do. We went for it and, um, and it exploded. If you could step into that future self and give yourself three pieces of advice, what do you think your future self would tell yourself now? Oh my gosh. That's one hell of a question. I haven't spoken publicly about this before, so I'm not even sure whether I want to say this, but... Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness. Very excited about our guest. We have the inspiring Chris Anderson in the house. Good to see you, sir. Welcome Good to the show. To see you, Lewis. I'm happy to be here. I'm very excited about this. Um, this is our first time meeting, and I've been inspired by your work and your the organization that you've been a part of for the last 20 plus years with TED and how you have changed the world in such a positive, informative way. So first, I want to acknowledge you for being of service to bring education, and entertainment to the masses that is helpful for human beings, not hurtful. And it's just inspiring to see how you've been able to spread and build media around the world. So thank you for all the work you've done and inspiring me with this show and, and my work as well. Well, that, and that's very kind. Um, I definitely feel like we're fellow travelers here. Yes. And of course, this isn't really me. This is a huge team. Uh -huh. Good circumstances, lucky timing, all this stuff. But, but thank you anyway. Of course, yeah. Now, you have been, you have access to and you've met some of the wealthiest people in the world. Mm. And I've had the privilege of meeting a lot of wealthy people, billionaires as well. And there are some that seem to be extremely generous. Your book, Infectious Generosity, um, talks about the power of being generous. Now, some wealthy people have built businesses and seem to be generous with everyone and other wealthy people seem to be a little bit more stingy with their wealth or with their money and their generosity. I'm curious, from your experience, do more wealthy people, you think, gain their wealth through being generous? Mm. Or is there other strategies that they do it? I'm not sure that most of them gain their wealth by being generous. I do think that many of them, once they are wealthy, seek to be generous. Uh, not all of them succeed. It's actually a very hard thing to do effectively, as as we'll discuss. But I think I also don't think that most of them really make their wealth through a really annoying exploitation. Mm. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a common. I mean, it's it's true that some do, but most modern fortunes are made by entrepreneurs who basically have some kind of tech dream that has become real and in this connected age, instead of gaining like a hundred customers or a thousand customers, they have gained millions or in some cases billions of customers. Because we're connected now across all countries, it is possible for people to make that kind of wealth like never before, just on the back of a really big and brilliant idea or service. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think those wealth gains are evil in on of themselves. Um, inequality is, is definitely a problem in our world. And, um, and it, but, but nonetheless, you know, people are extraordinarily cynical mm. about the very wealthy. And so what, what I would say that from my encounters with them, and I've been very lucky because of my role at TED and because of my role in something called The Audacious Project, that I've, I've got to meet some of them. And my, my honest belief is that many of them, I don't say all, many of them, would love to give back to the world. They mm. feel an obligation to give back to the world. They're excited at the prospect of giving back to the world. And I'd say that most of them are on a journey to figure out the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. Because it turns out it's really hard to write a really big check to make a difference in the world and do it the right way. Sure. It can go wrong in so many ways. Absolutely. Now, there's a lot of smart people who've made a lot of money, um, but they haven't figured out the happiness mm -hmm. equation. 
right? Do you feel like generosity increases your level of happiness when you are financially well off? I think being financially well off does in itself increase your happiness a little bit. What the science suggests is that there's a, uh, you know, early on when someone's really poor, having more money makes a huge difference. The richer you get, the less difference each incremental dollar makes. This still makes a little bit of difference. And if someone doubles their wealth, on average, the measurements at least suggest that they get a little bit of extra happiness for it. But what is amazing is that they have an opportunity to get much more happiness again by, by being generous. Um, and this is, this is an underreported fact. I wish it was more widely known. There was a Gallup study done of a couple hundred thousand people a, a, across the world asking them a bunch of different questions, including things like, did you contribute to a cause that you cared about recently? Those that had recently contributed to a cause on average showed a level of happiness, a greater level of happiness that was equal to their having doubled their income. Really? Yeah. Through giving? Through giving. So this is amazing. Um, and, and this applies to, to anyone. Certainly, I've spoken to very rich people who have found their deepest meaning by some kind of generosity pathway. But anyone can do this. And when you think about how much um, blood and sweat and tears we put into, oh, God, if only I could earn 20% more, all my dreams could come true, at least for six months. All of that happiness, this study suggests, is available by instead by um, adopting a generosity structure, building generosity into your life in some way. It surprises you by making you happy. That's interesting. Yeah, and in the book, Infectious Generosity, you, you, have a, you talk about an experiment where people were given $10,000 each, right? Right. What is this experiment and what were the findings of, of this? So this was a crazy, crazy fun experiment that I was lucky to have an inside view of. Because it was done, it was a partnership between the University of British Columbia and TED. And a donor in the TED community was willing to uh, support it and give away basically $2 million. But to do it $10,000 at a time to 200 strangers on the, on the internet. So we, we recruited people to say, come and be part of the mystery experiment. We didn't say anything about money. Really? We said, we said this is going to be exciting and interesting, could be stressful, will involve some time commitments, um, but um, come on in if you're, if, you're, if you're up for it. And um, 1, people, a couple of thousand people applied, and we, you know, we picked 200 to represent a spread of countries and income levels and so forth. And yeah, they got this note saying, okay, welcome, you're in the industry experiment. Um, we'd like to, it was like the ultimate scam email, right? We'd like to wire. <laughs> Give us we, your big details. We, we'd, <laughs> like to, we'd like to wire $10,000 into your PayPal account. Um, no question, no strings attached. Um, so they were skeptical at first, but, but eventually they, they, they were persuaded that this was for real. And all they had to do was to report on what they spent the money on. So what was the criteria? You can use it to spend it on anything? You could literally, we said you can use it to spend it on anything. So you could spend it on yourself, on your health. You could buy a car. You can do whatever you want. Ultimate vacation that you've dreamed of, et cetera. Anything, absolutely anything. Interesting. Um, the amazing thing is that on average, people gave away two thirds of the money. Really? Two thirds on average. And, it was, it's, and they got huge joy from doing so as well. The people who gave away more actually were happier than the people who, who, who didn't. Um, and so uh, th this economist, the traditional economic theory, rational agent theory, whatever, you, you, you would, would predict a different outcome than that, I think. And, uh, and it turns out that people have in them, we all have in them, not just an instinct for generosity, but an instinct to respond to other people's kindness and to want to respond in kind. And this struck me as, this is just such a beautiful thing because if you think about it, in this connected age, what does that mean? It means that if you can start a ripple of generosity, of kindness, there will be ripple effects. Wow. It, the wave is going to spread. And, uh, and when you dig a little bit and look for stories, you find again and again beautiful examples of this, this happening online. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm curious your your point of view on the flip side of generosity, where people feel like they have to give out of guilt. Hmm. 
or wealthy people maybe are feeling pressured to give or whoever, if you make any type of money, they're like, you should be giving more. You should be donating more to this cause. You should be giving more to your friends and your family. What happens when people give out of guilt? Is there still happiness or is there more resentment? That's an interesting question. I don't know if that's been measured. Um, I suspect there's less happiness in that thing. On the other hand, there may be less guilt and therefore yeah, yeah. maybe maybe a little bit more happiness. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the thing is, Lewis, I, I don't care that much as to why people give. What's one of the problems with, with our culture right now is that we are obsessed with why people are giving mm -hmm. and not the impact of their giving or how to give wisely. Here's, here's the irony. In, in this connected era, there is more reason than ever to give, not out of guilt, although you know it's a transparent era, maybe lots of people can throw heat at you or something, uh, but not really so much out of that, but out of, out of opportunity. It's actually quite easy, as we discovered at TED, <laughs> to give away something that people care about to, un to an unlimited number of people for a total distribution cost of zero dollars. Wow. So, so this, is, this is incredible. This has never been possible before in history. And when you understand that people respond to generosity, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, we, you know, our, we ended up reshaping our whole strategy just based on the fact that giving, the more we gave away, the more it benefited Ted. Whether it was done out of generosity or not, it would be the smart thing to do. So someone could critique that and say, well, but if it's not done out of generosity, it's not actually generosity. Well, what, why do we put these blocks in the way? We're in an era where we should be celebrating giving for every reason, because I, I think we're in an existential battle here between the good stuff spreading in our connected world and the bad stuff. Right. We are hampering the spread of good stuff through cynicism, through nitpicking, through critiques, through through all all sorts of reasons that are just they're just terrible reasons to get mad at someone. Like if so a rich person, let's say, does some act of charity and half of the people will say, Well, how did he make that money? Well, that wasn't enough. Or, he should have given more. Should have, yeah, all, all this stuff. But which which has probably the indirect consequence of the next person saying, you know what, I'm just going to wait. Screw these cynics. I, I don't need that. And so you, by, by, by doing that, we're literally taking money away from other recipients. Wow. Uh, we, we should not be doing that. We should. So, so I, I, I think we need to start celebrating imperfect generosity. Mm. I actually don't think generosity has ever been perfect. There's, there's always been mixed motives, you know, give and your reward shall be in heaven. I was, I was brought up to believe that. Right. Well, I'm sorry, that's selfishness. It's like, okay, I'll give, but uh, it's- I'm gonna be get rewarded later, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so now it's, it, giving is still hard. It's always hard to let go of something. Um, but we, it, we have lots of extra motivations that are actually exciting right now, which is that you can reach so many people, they'll be happy, they may well mm -hmm. respond and want to work with you or do something for you. At the very least, your reputation is, is impacted. Yes. And uh, I mean, this has happened to you in a beautiful way. Here you are, you've been laboring these last decade plus, yeah. um, putting out amazing content. And it's been hard work. But free it, content. Free content, but it's been a gift. And, you've, and, and there are literally millions of people around the world who are grateful to you, or certainly should be, for, 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 for the knowledge that you have brought into their minds that has changed them forever. This, yeah. is this is really an amazing world that we're in right now, that yeah. that can happen. I feel very grateful. Again, I feel like you and I, I mean, you've been leading the way, but I feel like we've been able to spread positive messages for free to people and impact people who are willing to listen or who want to listen or watch the information. And you were saying how it's extremely hard to, I guess, get through the noise of chaos, yeah. fear, stress, and anxiety content online. Mm -hmm. Or news media that's that's showing only the bad parts of the world and the the wars, diseases, and sadness and suffering as opposed to and it's very hard to spread a positive message in between all that for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. But I feel grateful that we've been able to do that. And I think when you make something that is of value to another person, that is generosity. Hundred percent. And it's you know, it's there are so many ways you can do that now. Anyone who can create 
a beautiful image or, or a gorgeous photograph or an amazing piece of AI, let's say, um, or poetry or a software program or, you know, an app or whatever. There are so many ways to give things away in a way that many people can benefit. And we're, the trouble is we're so used to it. We're, we're actually drowning in this sort of deluge of free content that we forget how amazing this is. This only showed up last Thursday. You know, <laughs> it's never happened before in history right, that right. people have had the choice of so much amazingness. And it actually, I find that almost switching from being, oh God, all these people are pestering me with their stuff to I'm the recipient of a torrent of amazingness. Mm. It kind of puts you into a, gratitude mode. And I kind of feel like we should be more grateful to the people who are doing this. A lot of the people who are doing this are dependent on our, you know, let's go onto Patreon and actually support that mm -hmm. incredible artist or yes. that incredible photographer or whatever. Absolutely. Um, and um, so it's, it's, it's an amazing time to be alive. There's all this stuff out there and we very quickly forget it. It just becomes blase. Sure. <laughs> now, when did you realize that generosity was important in your life? Were you always a generous person or is this something that you saw with Ted on how it started to unlock something inside of you personally? What what was the shift or was this always who you were? I was brought up by missionary parents. Um, my my dad was a, an eye surgeon. Um, my mother was a graduate who decided that she wanted to serve God by going out with him to these remote villages in Pakistan um, to offer you know, free cataract surgery and so forth wow. to, to people who had imagery. And that it was, was your, that was your mom. That, that was my mom. My father did the surgery. She, uh -huh. she was there, you know, supporting him in whatever way. And, and definitely they were extraordinarily generous. I mean, basically with their whole lives, um, what, whatever you make of their beliefs. Um, they were and, of service. Their whole life was service. Yeah. 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 They, they made, um, in the 60, fifties and sixties, like 30 pounds, 50 bucks a month. Uh, was what they they were they were paid, but but they were joyful with it, and and honestly, I thought I I was confused. Like I found it daunting. So something must have rubbed off. I th there's a story I haven't told. I don't think, but my you know my dad was involved in a terrible accident, um, ran over a uh, a kid, wow. died, and there was a whole you know he was almost jailed. He was then you know refused to pay off the judge, uh, uh, refused to pay off the police, you know, took responsibility, went, went to, took, took responsibility for it, ended wow. up being, being cleared. Um, and then, you know, made peace with the family, the father and his other son came and, um, and we had a meal with them. And, um, and I, 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 apparently, I don't remember doing this, but I gave this boy my best toy and, and, you know, we, we, I mean, how old and, you? and how could you not, right? When, right. when, 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 so I, I was, I would have been like four years old or something uh -huh. then, four or five. Wow. Um, but the, but that's, that, that's it. So much of generosity is instinct. That's not, that's, there's nothing, you know, laudable about that. It's just, you, you see someone who's, like, here's a boy who's, who's, whose brother has been killed. You would do anything you could, anyone would. Um, I've mostly felt guilty. Uh, my life but that I'm not doing enough. Really? Um, yeah, a little bit guilty. I mean, I've tried to, you know, put it aside, but it's it's like I've never found, I would say until recently, actually until writing this book, I've never found an answer to the Peter Singer argument. Um, Peter Singer, as some people will know, has, has, has said, look, there is no, all of us know that if we walked out of our door and saw a child drowning in a nearby pond, we would we would run into the pond, even if it meant getting our pants dirty, dirty or, whatever, yeah. or whatever. We would rescue the kid. You rescue the kid. Of, of, of course you would. Um, and yet, we know that there is a kid dying on the other side of the world who a check from us could save that life, and we don't write that check. And so, I, and so, I've the, the issue I've been wrestling with is that is generosity a bottomless pit of obligation and if so is there any pathway to a guilt-free life that of, wow. of and and i i couldn't find the answer to that and and i don't want a miserable life and i know that most people don't and i don't actually think that you can have moral rules that require people to have miserable lives because a they'll be rejected and b 
that would be more misery. <laughs> so we have to think of a different way through it. So I, I've been wrestling with this my, my whole life, and I, I, I finally made peace with it, uh, with with that specific issue. Mm. And uh, and I, so I think there is, I, I think there is a pathway to every, everyone finding their own form of generosity. For a lot of people, it's not about money at all. It's about mm. g gifting other things, any act of kindness or creativity. Uh, but there there is a way to a guilt free life that, really? is, that has some generosity in it but it doesn't it doesn't drive you to despair because you're not there's still someone suffering on the other side of the world and you are still buying a latte right <laughs> i find this interesting that you say this because you know you've essentially dedicated the last 20 plus years of your life to ted in spreading ideas of positivity of change of impact of service to help people and uh i don't know how many views or downloads Ted has received in the last 20 plus years, but I'm assuming billions and billions and billions and billions of people have consumed your content, been impacted deeply by it, have felt transformation, healing tools to serve their life. And so, and to hear you say you still have, you know, you haven't figured out the solution to, <laughs> to feeling guilty of not doing more is interesting. But at the same time, I understand where you're coming from because, you know, I've been, you know, I really like what Scott Harrison has done at Charity Water and Adam Braun at Pencils of Promise, where water and education for kids is something that I've been donating to for many years. But it's almost like this you see, when you go to these places, you see the pain and the challenges that these communities might be facing that you don't face. And you say, wow, there's so much that I could be doing more to help more communities. Mm. Um, but there seems to be almost a limit of how much you can give to, or is there? <laughs> I mean, it's like, you don't also want to be like homeless yourself uh, and just say, I'm going to give everything away. That's right. That's right. Like, how do you navigate I, that decision making? So here's what I did for, for the book. I did some math, basically. Um, some people feel like the problems in the world are infinite. Mm. I think they're large. I don't think they're infinite. Um, and I, I, so I, I worked with, um, a woman called Natalie Cargill, who runs, who has a thing called Longview Philanthropy. She actually gave a very good TED talk about this, about what, what, the, the, the theoretical question, what would maximum philanthropy look like? Like, what is the most philanthropy that the world needs? And in a nutshell, the, the, this is slightly simplifying the argument, but in a nutshell, the numbers she came up with it is that if we were giving away three and a half trillion dollars a year, this is the world, <laughs> to philanthropy, we could tackle basically every single problem that philanthropy can tackle. Um, in, in, and, you know, from poverty to inequality to the existential threats of things like AI to climate to, you know, like pick your, pick your issue. Right. You could, you could do all of that to the extent where the bottleneck then to problems would not be more philanthropy, it would be actually executing and, and, and doing it. So that's a, you've got that number. Now, what would it take to raise that much in, in philanthropy? So again, we did the, did the math. And what I was guided by was, as just as a start point, were the two religious traditions that are out there. So there's a tradition in, in Judaism and Christianity of tithing, which is to say give. 10% of mm -hmm. your income to, to charity, if you can afford it. Um, and in um, Islam, there's, there's this pillar of Islam, zakat, which means give one fortieth of your wealth annually, two and a half percent of your net worth annually. Mm. Now it's interesting, you know, for the very rich, for example, 10% of income isn't really much of an ask. Many of them don't have much income, if any, anyway, they're, li you know, they're, they're living off God knows what, off, the, off their investments, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but 2.5% of net worth annually is a real, is a real thing, ask. It's, it's probably at least triple what they're giving right now on, on average. When you add up, if you say if the top 5 or 6% wealthiest people in the world did this, and actually if only a third of them did this, because some people... Won't ever, right, right, right. Well, whatever, get round to it. That would actually raise the three and a half trillion annually. So, so 
I, th I think there's a case to, to circulate and accept among us this idea that we, we, should, we should, those of us who are com reasonably comfortably off should agree a pledge which is the higher of 10% of your income or 2.5% of your net worth. If we did that, that your obligations mm. are done financially. You've there are other ways you can be, you can be good, but that, that is your obligation. If you do that, you're, you're done and you can find other ways to be generous or whatever. And, and it actually, it actually, so to me, and it, it's a slightly quirky argument. Some people may not buy it or like it, but for me, it was this huge sigh of relief. But it also persuaded me to to sign that pledge. Interesting. Um, and um, huh. and and I I think if that was if that was widely circulated, one, we could dream of an incredible future where instead of thinking of charities, it's sort of slightly, you know, solve the latest, put a band aid on the latest problem, and it's sort of kind of wearying almost and exhausting and annoying to think about. Instead, we would be thinking about this huge pot of cash and the ability to dream audaciously about what what change could actually look like. You know, you could have spectacular problems. Yeah, you'd, you'd be able to imagine what it would take to plant a trillion trees on, on our planet and manage them effectively in forests so that it it sequesters enough carbon to save the future, et cetera. In, and and um, so, so many other things. And you could, you, we could dream big, we could get excited about the future and it would shift how we think about, you know, what, what the world of charity and, and philanthropy looks like. That's interesting. I guess one follow-up question there might be like, if someone wants to donate to charity, how do they know that that money is going to the cause versus the organization and, and getting lost in the organization? Right. That's right. a whole other conversation, I guess, but. It's, well, the thing is, if you, if you, if you make a pledge, um, then it shifts your giving to strategic. So it, it makes it worth your while to actually find out an answer to that question. There you go, to do the research. That's and all right. Things, yeah. Whereas normally we just, you know, you see a need, you, oh God, I better write a check and go, and I don't really know whether that organization's gonna do anything or not. This says to you, I'm gonna give them, a, at some point this year, we're gonna give away this much. So our family or whatever, right. we need to sit and think about this. and it, and you can you can basically most of the best nonprofits have around them a community of supporters. If you connect with them and learn, the question to ask is not what is what percentage is their overheads or whatever. That because overhead, overheads often the overheads are the most important part of what an org is doing. The question to ask is, are they effective? Mm, are um, they getting results? Are they getting results? Impact? Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, what is their point of leverage? Why are they being effective? Some charitable organizations have amazing answers to that question. And, um, and you could actually end up finding yourself with a community of people who will become great friends and, yeah. hey, this is making me joyful and happy and excited and I'm engaged and energized. So it's it, that, that shift from impulse charity to thoughtful charity, mm -hmm. I think is incredibly important. That's cool. I don't know if you've done the research on this or if maybe you've experienced this personally, but what unlocks in someone when they give financially, whether it's a little amount or a big amount, what unlocks emotionally, mentally, and spiritually inside of them when they physically give money? It's probably a slightly different story in each case. Um, the, the Just literally writing a check per se may not do anything like the more we're, we're, we're biological beings the more you can see the actual result of what you did mm. that makes it has a big impact on 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 how you feel so i mean i again i i would encourage people if you're going to spend real money to try and get involved with, with a charity and get get to you know go on a field trip with them and get to actually yes. see the, the people whose lives are being impacted it is it is a beautiful beautiful thing to do that and if you do that then then you'll you'll feel a glow of of wow i i like this version of me i like this version of me that one was willing to be generous two was willing to be thoughtful about that generosity and three look at these amazing new people i've met and and uh, look at what's happening this is this is great mm -hmm. um but it's it's probably a different <laughs> case it, i mean look there's many other ways to be generous it's not just writing a check and and many other ways may well have almost like a, a more immediate 
payback, like in terms of being gratifying. Yeah, and, using your and time so and energy and things like that. Yeah, just just connecting with someone on the street. Absolutely, and, uh, you a know. moment of generosity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. I've asked a, this similar question to a lot of wealthy individuals about abundance, and when they give, and it almost seems like people who make a lot of money, the more they give, the more they make. Not every year, every time, but it seems like it it something expands inside of them when they give and they almost give uncomfortably like, ah, oh, this is a big amount. Mm -hmm. And who knows what's going to happen with this money, but I'm going to give it because I want to be of service. So many of these wealthy individuals say that like they made the most money that year or the next year, like hmm. so much money came back to them in their business or their opportunities that they were up to. Have you seen a correlation with that? The hmm. more people give financially with a good intention that more goodness comes their way financially in the future. So I, I definitely don't believe there's some kind of karmic, you know, woo-woo thing going on where, where, you know, if you do that, somehow the universe says, direct more money to that person now. Um, but um, I, I do think that in the age that we're in, generous people can get more done. Mm. Like they, they, they will attract great other people to want to work with them. So this is the thing about, if you ask the question, where, how is value created in our modern era? It's largely created through the creation of, of the products of human minds, creativity of different kinds, whether it's software, video, content in general, or even in a, in a, in a like in a, you know, here's, here's a, a, a steel manufacturer, the software that, you know, optimizes how that steel is manufactured. That is probably where the competitive edge comes from. So to, to hire those people and to motivate them, they have a lot of choices about where they could work. They do not want to work for an evil company. They want to work for someone who is generous and for, who, is, who is doing their part to give back to the planet. And so I, I, I think that that effect probably does happen and that, mm. and that um, you know, people will want to do that. I mean, even sort of take someone who a lot of people don't like right now, you know, Musk, um, he, he, his justification for Tesla being generous and giving away its patents, it, it wasn't directly for the benefit of, of Tesla, particularly in any way. It was that this would allow him a better chance of recruiting great engineers. Interesting. So the, the best engineers don't want to work for a company. They want to work for a cause. So they, you know, like, and, and so, you know, they want to work for the electrification of the future. And so we are making that more possible, you know, and I, and I think, I think whether that's spoken or unspoken, um, hmm. the, that, that is, that is a real thing that just, just happens that people will be more want to support that, that, that kind of person. Beyond that, I would say that even if that, that person didn't make more money, um, I bet that their life overall is is better, is happier, right? From it, because they they you know that th they are being a more whole mm, person. Mm. They, so they may not be generating more abundance of money, but creating more abundance of wholeness, of happiness, of yeah. love, of peace, yeah. of you know harmony inside of them. Yes, um, absolutely. And that is worth a lot of money. Yeah, to create a feeling of inner peace. Yeah. Harmony in your environment, great relationships. You know, I'd rather have uh, that than all the money yeah. in the world. There are companies who who have had, I think, direct value creation as a result of their generosity. Um, I mean, I, one, one example I, I speak about is is pa Patagonia, for mm -hmm. example, where you know, percentage of profits was paid to vi environmental causes, and and um, the, the whole ethos of the company was to be generous to the future of the planet. That very fact is what brought them hordes of sort of next generation customers who care about this stuff. Chobani Yoga is known as, an, as a generous em employer, um, employed a lot of people from um, challenged communities and was generous mm -hmm. to them um, and um, gave them shares and so forth. And again, I, I, I think that is connected, in, that is part of the motivation why I buy Chobani Yoga, and I think many others buy Chobani Yoga. It's delicious, sure, but it's but it it come it it's a good company doing you know where they're 
their de generosity is built into their actual business strategy. How can people build generosity into their lives and their business strategies moving forward? So it's, I think it's a different answer in the case of every business, but, but I think a really, really cool thing to do for any company would be to schedule a half day or a day's retreat with your most creative people. Um, and to ask this question, what is the craziest thing that we could give away? Because mm. um, every, every company has a lot of assets that in principle could be shared freely online. I mean, I've, I've used the fantasy of um, Coke. You know, like if I, was, if I was going to Coke, I would say, to, okay, the secret recipe of yours of law that is supposed to be the source of all your wealth. You know, it's the secret recipe that no one knows and that's why Coke is so amazing. And, you know, here's an idea, give it away. Give it away, publish it, let everyone in the world in their kitchen and show them in their kitchen how they can make their own Coke. And, uh, and invite them to improve the recipe. You know, it's like, I mean, there's, for one thing, there's too much sugar in, in Coke, for God's right. sake. So How can you make so, it taste better with less uh, sugar? It, ex ex exactly. Make, make that a challenge and offer a 10 million price. You know, give, we, what, for the best new improved recipe, we're going to launch this new brand, the People's Coke. Um, my prediction, if they were to do that, first of all, I think they lose zero competitive advantage because everyone kind of knows what the, what the recipe actually is. Right. And we can reverse sugar engineer. Sugar and water. For, God, yeah, yeah. for God's sake. <laughs> but two... It's a really cool thing to do, and you you could end up with a huge new brand and a lot of delighted customers um, because of because you are saying here we are we are committed to generosity we are committed to a generosity stretch and any any company has knowledge that they could consider turning into a free online course we're going to give away our competitive secrets because we want the world to get better we want others to learn from what we're using and by the way. We want a reputation for being the leader here in this knowledge so that we can recruit the best employees for the future. Wow. I think it, I think it could be super powerful. That's really interesting. So I asked the question, <laughs> what is the craziest thing we could give away? Yeah. And maybe not giving away all your money right away, but what's something unique you can give away? It, exactly. So, so, so definitely not suggesting stupidity. Right. Um, but, but being smart about it. You know, when, when we gave away our, our brand, um, to allow TEDx organizers around the world to, Interesting. to put on, they, anyone in the world could apply for a free license to put on a TED event, but they had to call it TEDx. We had, we had, so we had rules and we had tools. The rule said you had to label it TEDx, where X stands, you know, it's a local, so TEDx and your City, town, yeah. town name or whatever. Um, so it means self-organized. Um, and, and there were some other rules, you know, you've got to stick to our format and so forth. But you um, lack control. But you control it. You you choose. You yeah. do it where you want. You pick the speakers you uh -huh. want, and so forth. And we we trust you to honor our, our our values and our rules. And and but then you have a bunch of tools, which is here is the great way to think about coaching speakers. You know, here are, here are some of the secrets that people have learned to how to make an event riveting and compelling, and so forth, and how to build community. And what happened was that. People, I mean, people learn from each other. I think from each other even more than they learn from us. Right. And you had, we ended up with 3,000 different curation teams. So, so Ted, Ted is 200 full-time employees. Out there in the world are 60 to 70,000 plus people who are putting on Ted events on their own time without being paid at their own financial risk and generating 25,000 videos a year, including many of the best TED speakers. And Simon, TED Talks, Simon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simon Sinek came through TEDx. Brene Brown came through TEDx. Um, so so all, we just gave away our, our brand and took some risks. What we got back was unbelievable. It's unbelievable what came back. And you, you could not build a global events business. You know, I've got, I've got 10 employees overlooking that particular part of the business generating, you know, all, all of that content. It's, it's amazing. How much, it, how many? It's all from generosity. Yeah, that's uh, incredible. But it's, it's generous, it's, 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 it's careful generosity, okay? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 in a way, it's calculated. It's done with generous intent. Fascinating. But it's, but it's, um, um, but, but what it led to is so special and, and it's led to thousands and thousands of people being themselves unbelievably generous. Now, 
I'm curious. It sounds like this was one of the biggest and best decisions you ever made with TED was allowing local organizers to create events. I'm assuming that was one of the top yes. three best decisions. Yeah, I think it, probably the the number the one single, decision, probably right? Probably the number one. Now, how many, if you could calculate, how many, how much impact or views do TEDx event videos get and lives impacted versus kind of main stage TED uh, annual conference? Like, what is the difference between impact in yeah. giving away the secret sauce and allowing others to manage and control it essentially under your guidelines versus you having complete control over everything and doing it all yourself? Yeah. I think there's, there's, there's three big parts of TED that have an impact out there in, in the world. Um, there's main, m main TED, there's TEDx, and then there's TED-Ed, which is our, our, our youth-oriented thing, which is, which is short animated videos. I think it's about a third, a third, a third. Really? Like they, they, they all have a very approximately a billion views or impressions a annually. Wow. Um, and, um, a billion and views annually, each, each e category. E e each of those categories, yeah. And, and and what it and it, the TED the TED portion of it is like 100, 140 people or so doing that. The TED Ed part is probably forty people. The TEDx part is ten people, and it's the same Im impact because it's wow. ten people Marriage plus sixty five thousand. You know, it's wild. Like it's it's really trying to uh, putting my business my entrepreneurs hat on it. It's like how, how did that happen? Because that. That suggests it, it is that more than anything that convinced me that in this connected age, the rules around what you give away have changed. They've changed. They've changed. And, you, and so every business should think hard about what is your generosity strategy. It could be the most important decision you make. This is fascinating. Now, how long were you into TED until you decided to do TEDx? Like, how many years was that? And when was the idea of like, okay? We need to spread this more. Let's just let other people do their own events. How did this go about? Right, right, right. Uh, I took it over at the end of 2001. 2006 was when online video came along and it became possible to give away content. On YouTube, yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was again, in its own way, a big kind of scary decision at the time, but, but it worked out super well because that, that is what spread TED Because to before you didn't, you didn't give it away for free to people. We couldn't. We couldn't do it online, yeah. You, you know, we, it, was, it was at a once a year conference. TV, we tried to get it on TV. TV thought that public lectures are so boring, my friend, don't be silly, go away. <laughs> and so it wasn't until, you know, we'd, we actually tried it online and they went viral that, that, mm -hmm. that we realized that that was the thing we could do. And so we just decided to give away all of our best content. Somehow the conference, instead of withering away, you know, accelerated because pe more people knew about it. Uh, was that your decision, or did someone say, "Hey, we should try this out"? How did this go about? It was, it was there was a team. There was a team of us. It was a great, a great team. I had a wonderful colleague back then, June Cohen, who, who um, helped lead the charge uh, on this. And you know, we we were kind of looking. Can, are we going to do this? Isn't this risking the whole thing? Um, but um, um, we we both just got really excited. Like the, the, the it was the reaction from people who'd watched the first couple of experiments we did, where it wasn't clear to us before that the inspiration from a talk could work on video, you know, uh, and it, and it, it, it amazingly did. And I, I just, I had, that hadn't been obvious to me that, that, that would work. You know, there's so much in the room, there's the person and there's, right, right. there's it, it's different than pixels on a screen. turns out not, you can, you know, the inspiration and the insight and so forth can spread beautifully on video. So we, 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 we went for it and, um, and, uh, have, and it exploded. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. It was amazing. It was thrilling. incredible. It was really, really thrilling. And so that was 2006 when that started to happen. And then when did TED Ed start to happen? When did you realize right. let's do this for animated, you know, right. kids, different styles? TED Ed was another gift from giving away. We had a fellows program, so we gave away attendance at the TED conference to incredible people who couldn't afford to come. And one of the first people who benefited from that program, this guy called Logan Smalley. He, he, he came, he, he wrote to us and said, you know, I'm, I'm an educator and you, you could do something for education. You could do something for kids, like, you know, shorter animated content. And um, we, we went for it. He, again, the spirit of generosity, he persuaded thousands of teachers and hundreds of different animation studios to 
basically either donate or, or strongly discount their, their, their services to create these little short five minute videos. And, um, um, and, and again, they, they took off. And so we get notes from teachers saying, I've been teaching all my life. I teach a new class, 30 people every, every year. So I've, you know, I've, over my career, I've reached um, a thousand kids. Mm -hmm. um, and the lesson that I wrote for you, which is the best lesson that I love to give that you turn into an animation, I've now reached a hundred thousand kids in a week. And, and it's, it's, you know, so the emotion from that, that is thrilling. The feeling, the, feeling, the no. impact of it. Yeah. Uh, and, and wow. so, so there's, so again, there's, there's a sort of, a, a surprising element of generosity at every stage in that, that causal chain, a gift to Logan to come to Ted, his gift to us with the idea, his work of attracting an incredible team. And then hundreds of teachers giving their knowledge, animators creating these, it's, it's so exciting to see that, that, that type of chain reaction. And if you hadn't been infectious in your generosity, then the, it wouldn't have infectively spread right. with more generosity. You talk right. about the ripple effect, like that one act of saying, hey, come here for free, Yeah. since you're unable to afford this. Um, they were so impacted, they said, let's, let's reach out to more people yeah. and create a whole other arm, essentially, of your business or your, your foundation right. that serves and impacts millions of people daily. Yeah, it's, it's surprising. It was, it was around about the same time that TEDx started, that we started giving away, you know, like trying out these TEDx events to see just how badly they would, they really? would go wrong or not. And, and I'm uh, sure not all of them go well. Also, it's like no, you have to let go of the the image of Ted of like, oh, this was a you know a chaotic experience. And we've we, we've had a few embarrassing moments for sure, where where a speaker got booked who who we was not the right fit or yeah, or pseudoscience or something like that or whatever. Um, but um, but the, the the more amazing thing is 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 um, how much it went right, and 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 so yeah, so so that was. Um, that was 2008 that that started. If you could go into the future 10 years huh. and you could imagine yourself 10 years in the future and you could look back at yourself right now and have a conversation with yourself 10 years in the future. And if you could see everything that would unfold with AI or whatever else unfolds over the next 10 years and all the different challenges of the world, but also the opportunities and beauty of the world, hmm and the wisdom that you would create from the next 10 years, if you could step into that future self and give yourself three pieces of advice, what do you think your future self would tell yourself now? Oh my gosh. That's one hell of a question. Um. <laughs> because you've seen over the last 20 plus years, so many things happen. Yeah. And I'm sure that if you could give yourself advice now, back then, maybe you would have told yourself what to do or different changes. But what do you see based on the trend of the last 20 years for the next 10 years? I mean, I haven't spoken publicly about this before, so I'm not even sure whether I want to say this, but um, let's say I do since you asked. Um, I mean, look, the, the, the logic of the strategy that we've adopted, which is just embracing generosity, trying to figure out what we can give away. The more that we've given away, that every time we've found an answer to that, we've been surprised. Um, and so, I I think I mean look I'm I'm sixty seven now for Christ's sake, but I'm sixty seven now for goodness sake. <laughs> and um, what's the secret to looking so good at uh, sixty seven? Uh, and. Um, I, I think the logical thing that I need to figure out how to do in the next 10 years is how to give Ted itself away. Like to, I, I, I shouldn't be running forever. Um, it's a nonprofit. It's, um, it's a very healthy operation. There's an amazing team there. Right now, I'm the sole director of the foundation, you know, that runs it. I'm, I'm in control, but, but ideas are for the world and for the future. Ideas last forever. Um, you know, my, my long-term dream, I guess, is that like pe the best people who are giving talks today, they, 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 you know, they put their life into these talks. They're sharing so much experience and wisdom. Um, I want those talks to be available for hundreds of years for, you know, if only just for historical curiosity. But I mean, 
ideas shape history more than um, anything. So I, I want I want Ted to have a long term future, mm. and it won't be me running it. So I I somehow need to figure out in the next few years how to give it away and who to give it away to. Wow. Um, and um, um, uh, but I I don't have an answer to that question yet. But I'm thinking about it, and so I guess I what I hope what I hope my ten years into the future self would say to me is. Chris, that conversation you had with Lewis 10 years mm -hmm. ago, that was, that was the start of something beautiful. I've only got a few minutes left with you. Um, I feel like we could talk for another few hours. There's so many more things I want to ask you, uh, but I want people to get your book, Infectious Generosity, the ultimate idea worth spreading. I want people to get a copy of the book, get a few copies for your friends. This will be a powerful tool and resource to support you in creating more happiness in your life because I truly believe that when we give... It's almost the most selfish act you can do because it feels so good. It's It fills you up in big ways. So being generous is almost selfish in a way, but it's a good selfish. Cool. Um, because I truly believe when you give and help others and you see how joyful they are in your giving, I, I don't know what you can do for yourself that is a better feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you want to take care of yourself and, and be healthy and make sure your needs are met, but... Giving is one of the greatest tools. So I'm so glad that you created this book for people to to have access, tools, and resources on how to give more generously and why it's so valuable and meaningful in your life. So I want people to get a copy of this by Chris Anderson. They can go to your um, website, infectiousgenerosity.org, which is an AI communication tool on how to give more generously, right? Yeah, there's an AI on that, on that uh, website. It's called TIG, the Infectious Generosity Guru. Ooh, okay. <laughs> TIG is a lot of fun. It can help you brainstorm what, what you can do. It listens to what your interests are, what your skills are, and, and then you can, you can play with it. It's pretty cool. Okay, cool. So people can go there, infectiousgenerosity.org. They can follow you on Twitter or on X, which is your main platform of choice these days. They're in LinkedIn. You're at Ted Chris on X. Um, and they can get the book anywhere books are sold, Amazon and bookstores, everywhere else. So make sure you guys get a copy of Infectious Generosity. There's so many more things I would love to ask you about, but hopefully we can stay in touch and do this again in the future. Um, but I have a couple final questions. This is a question I ask everyone towards the end of our conversation. It's called the three truths. Hmm. So we asked you to go 10 years into the future, but I'd love you to go as far as you can in the future to the last day. Imagine you get to extend your life as long as you want, but eventually it's the last day for you in this world. And you have created everything you want from this moment until that last day. Personally, professionally, you've made anything you want to make. But for whatever reason, on this last day, in this hypothetical question, you have to take everything with you to the next place. So no one, we don't have access to TED content. We don't have access to your book. This conversation, it's gone. Everything you've ever said, we no longer have access to. But on the last day, you get to leave behind three truths, three lessons that you know to be true that the world can have access to. What would those three truths be for you? <laughs> okay, now I get why people <laughs> come back to this podcast. This is, this is amazing. I think the single most amazing superpower that humans have is the ability to dream, to, to literally think of possible futures and kind of test them in their minds and in conversations and in imagination. No one else can do this. We literally get to explore, if you like, possibility spaces. And, and then when we've found one that a few of us think that's actually pretty cool, we have a shot at actually building it and shaping it so we can intentionally shape the future. This is the single most amazing thing about our species to me. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would say, never forget that. Never forget that whatever the future is, whatever you're going on to, keep dreaming mm. and find fellow dreamers who, who, because then you have a shot at building anything, you know, building anything. That's one. I think, I think I've just, I've become more and more aware of the, the gift, one particular type of gift, which is the gift of encouragement. Um, 
it's 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 an easy gift in some ways to give to someone, but it can it can make so much difference mm. to a life just to hear it, you know in that sort of time starved world that we're in someone say you you are great actually what you're doing is great thank you go on go on don't stop go on and so i think i'd, I'd never want to forget that which is also a great form of being generous yeah encouragement yeah and the final thing is to remember how complex we are. I mean, I'm assuming that what might go forward is still human beings as we are with all our flaws and issues. It's don't be owned by your lizard brain, by mm. your instinct of self. Um, everything good in life comes by trying to figure out how to put your reflective self to use to guide that lizard brain. Our instinctive selves are beautiful. They have like a mm -hmm. lot of the best feelings, and the most intense things that we do are kind of, you know, they're, they're our instinctive self behavior. But, um, but we need to bring our reflective selves mm -hmm. to the party. So Absolutely. I would say it, it's ultimately, it'll be my reflective self in that moment that looks back and, and says, so what do you think? You know, um, what, what do we make of that life? What's the, st it's, our, our reflective self is our storytelling self mm -hmm. and the stories we tell about ourselves are ultimately what what endure and what we what we care about yeah the meaning we give yeah the stories that we have in our life yeah those are great truths um chris i want to acknowledge you again for the impact you continue to make and you've made for such a long time on humanity um in a world where people can literally do whatever they want you've decided to do something impactful so i appreciate the consistency of 23 plus years now of your involvement in TED and really bringing change in a positive way to the world and to humanity. So I'm very grateful for your generosity and for your wisdom today on this, this conversation. And I hope we do more together in the future. Um, my final question is, what is your definition of greatness? The ability to bring something great out of others. Mm. Any, any one person can be amazingly great, but if that might just be one person. We're a social, we're a social species. We need each other, we depend on each other, we're influenced by each other. The greatest greatness is the greatness that spreads. Mm. There you go. Chris, thanks so much, appreciate you being here. There is all the money that everybody needs and wants waiting there for them. And there's only one reason it's not in their lives and that's because they're stopping it from coming into their lives. Really? Oh yeah. How are we stopping it? by thinking we don't have enough. <laughs>